Hello, thanks for joining today's presentation from Real Story Group. This is Scott Dill. I'm on the, the sales team here, and uh, our founder and CEO, Tony Byrne, will join us momentarily to talk through the heart of today's presentation. Uh, always an exciting one for us as we're uh, going to be providing you with some in-depth analysis of the uh, latest edition of our vendor map, the uh, infamous subway map that we've had for over a decade now. We'll uh, actually take you on a little history lesson as we get started with the uh, the 2010 version of the map, but uh, really Tony's going to focus on um, you know, what we're seeing now, what to expect uh, in 2020 and beyond. So thank you for taking some time out of your day to join us for today's session. It's going to be about 30 minutes in length, and we'll have some time at the end for questions. So if you do have those, you can enter those into the questions tab and the go to webinar control panel. And you will also be able to uh, access the slides from today's session. Those will be available to you in a couple of days from our marketing team. So uh, keep an eye out for that. I do see some new names uh, here with us on today's webinar. So welcome. And I uh, want to give you a little bit of background about Real Story Group. Uh, we're an industry analyst firm. We've been going at this for uh, almost 20 years now. And really, our model is quite different from those that you may be uh, more familiar with in that we never work for the vendors that we cover within our research. So we don't advise them in any way. Uh, we don't do any sort of quid pro quo when it comes to if they subscribe, we'll um, you know, say nice things about them uh, in the research. Rather, our approach is to provide you with uh, the real story on what the vendors do well, uh, and maybe more importantly, what they don't do so well and when they might fall short for you. You know, we don't believe there's any sort of uh, magical quadrant or wave that's going to get you to the right shortlist. Rather, we believe in evaluating the vendors based on uh, a number of use cases and strategic considerations. And we'll get into the uh, the subscription model at the end and, and how you can download some of our research. But I uh, certainly wanted to give you this as a little bit of a background about Real Story Group. And as I mentioned, we're going to take a, a closer look at uh, our web, our excuse me, our vendor map. Uh, which you'll see next on the screen. This really provides you with an outline of uh, the different markets we cover uh, and the vendors we evaluate within each of these particular areas. And from here, I'm going to hand things over to Tony to take you into that uh, part of the presentation. Tony? Great. Thanks a lot, Scott. This is always one of my favorite times of year when we update the vendor map for the following year. So this is the new 2020 omni-channel stack vendor map um, and uh, a lot of interesting changes this year um, some new lines to the map certainly a lot of new vendors some dropping um, a lot going on across these spaces and i'm going to use the next half hour to kind of talk about what all that means aside from just dots moving around on a page and I think it's interesting and significant now that, of course, we're also going into a new decade. And I thought it would be useful to go back and take a look at the 2010, what we called then the content technology vendor map. Some similarities, um, but also some changes. So this was uh, the world uh, that we cover on the dawn of what was a, a new decade then. A um, lot of interesting things going on, of course, still had web content management, um, digital asset management in the pink line. Uh, we had this beige line, multi-channel publishing, which was really about XML and structured content management. That's kind of making a comeback under a new guise that we'll talk about for 2020. So this was kind of the dawn of a decade when I think many of us were still experimenting with a number of these tools. Um, and it's worthwhile talking a little bit and just sort of reviewing you know, what's happened since then, of course, Autonomy interwoven was a big player in the center, then uh, went to HP and then largely to open text and, you know, kind of fell off the, the game there. EMC also a big player through acquisitions, largely sold uh, their portfolio again to open text, who seems to be the buyer of last resort on a number of these things. IBM just in the last couple of years, selling off most of its portfolio to uh, create a new firm acoustic and then some things to HCL as well. Um, what was interesting was, you know, one of the big players that would emerge is Adobe, which we had over on the far right. They had not yet acquired Day Software, which would give them a web content management system and a dam. They had just acquired um, Omniture for web analytics. So 
um, you know, interesting times. And I, I think this was kind of like a world sort of coming into formation as of 2010. Um, but by, you know, when, and, and what happened over the course of that decade is that we all tried to build these sort of modern stacks, you know, that would have social marketing automation, web content management, digital asset management, and try to push this engagement through multiple channels. And I think for most of you, you've spent the past decade or so kind of modernizing each one of these channels, trying to do this more effectively, swapping tools in and out, sort of maybe going um, uh, from, from more experimental to um, to more uh, uh, mainstream vendors uh, and, and, and markets that, that, that matured here. The problem with this particular approach, though, is that we ended up with um, a lot of engagement silos. And so as we look to the 2020s with Real Story Group, we're thinking that there's likely to be a different reference model from the 2010s, where you still have this content and engagement management services in the middle here, WCM, email marketing, social, CRM, and Salesforce automation service and support, all these different customer touch points, but that what's going to happen is that a lot of the decisioning and data um, and personalization and some content is going to be pushed lower in your stack, what we call enterprise foundation services that are going to be completely channel agnostic, um, where the enterprise can then create uh, more customer-centered experiences as opposed to channel-centered experiences. And you'll see a lot of changes to our map are kind of reflective of this world that, to be sure, is still under formation. We think there's four key business service services in this layer. You'll see these as four lines on our map now. Uh, orchestration decisioning, which is really around listening, mapping, and then executing and, and, and optimizing and measuring journeys. Customer data platforms, you've seen us talk and write a lot about that. Um, and uh, then um, omni-channel content platform, um, which we'll talk about in a minute for kind of base reusable assets. And then uh, alongside all of this is this sort of emerging operations hub. So a lot of interesting things um, across the market here um, that are that are going on and, and really in many cases kind of emerging or re-emerging marketplaces. Still, uh, what we've always had from the very beginning is um, is this notion of a kind of a city center. And, and I think as we saw from 2010 to 2020, that city center has kind of changed a fair bit. Um, Microsoft has sort of come in and out of this space. Um, and uh, uh, Acoustic now being the remnants of the IBM portfolio, Adobe now very firmly in the city center, Oracle always there, although its level of commitment um, has has varied over the years, um, had acquired a number of these tools. And then, of course, Salesforce, which is now a big player. I don't think it was even on our map uh, 10 years ago. And so you still have this city center, and they're still telling kind of the same story that you should buy all these tools um, from the same vendor to create, uh, you know, that you can get to omni-channel through, through this kind of a, you know, suite. And so, what we've been arguing really all year, and I think we're going to argue just as vociferously in the next decade, is that there's no vendor and no technology platform that's on the channel. You can build an on the channel stack. Your stack is going to be different than other organizations' stacks. So you can build an on the channel stack, but you're not going to get on the channel from a single vendor. If anything, you're going with a single vendor may often reinforce different silos that you have. So that then brings us, I think, to some uh, sort of enduring thoughts about what this map is is telling us and not telling us. I think first is with this notion I was just talking about that there's across all these marketplaces this concept of center versus periphery that you, know, you have these major vendors in the middle that purport to sell a lot of solutions that may or may not be integrated as part of a suite. They'll call it a cloud. We still call it a suite versus some you know best of breed solutions. Um, certainly, you've got choices between new versus more established solutions in this marketplace, products versus platforms, so product being very simple, out of the box, platform being something you can customize uh, for better or worse. And then cloud native versus cloud enabled, which is really interesting because in certain marketplaces like web content management, they typically see much more cloud enabled than cloud native. On the other hand, in certain other marketplaces, certainly CDP is a great example, it's much more cloud native. 
Uh, we see pervasive fragmentation, which is another way of saying there's a lot of stops <laughs> in each one of these uh, metro lines, and that's not a bad thing. Um, it, it means that you have a lot of choices, um, and when we find that technology marketplaces like others tend to um, lose innovation when there's a monopoly or an oligopoly. And But part of this is that there's major regional differences, so we still see vendors who are more or less focused on EMEA or Asia-Pac or North America. Um, and obviously substantial model variations. So in any given marketplace, you'll see very different sort of license models go to market through a channel or not. How do they handle uh, uh, tenancy and, and hosting and other services? And then the complexity spectrum is often a really good way to sort of understand these markets. So that's what the subway map doesn't do. And I'm going to be spending some more time in a few minutes here talking about how to organize these tools by complexity. The other thing that we're really seeing a lot uh, and, and this kind of ebbs and flows is what we call market boundary overlap, which means that you have vendors who do one thing, but then maybe parts of another thing. Um, and uh, so that may be a good thing if you can kill two birds with one stone, but if you're tra also trying to have a little bit more flexibility and a more services oriented architecture, that can be a problem. A great example of this is CDP vendors trying to sell you orchestration services or journey orchestration vendors trying to sell you CDP services or your web content management system saying that it can be your CDP, which by the way, you never want to do. Um, and, and so that, that's when there's problems, when, when, um, when a vendor tries to do multiple things and that ends up um, coupling services together in a way where you would rather that they be decoupled. So there's some general trends. Now let's talk about specific markets. So first, the web content and experience management marketplace, uh, best understood um, because it's a mature market, you can kind of break it down by, by complexity where you have on the far left you know, toolkits ranging to the far right, um, simpler products. Um, and the line there between platform and products that you see is typically like, do I need an internal developer or not to really master this particular um, solution? So um, you can see there that um, the solutions on the left have more native richness, more customizability, more extensibility, but they also bring complexity, developer intensivity, and long-term costs. So we're not making value judgments here, just that you can kind of understand this market on a complexity spectrum. And there's some key trends here as well that are sort of worth pointing out. Um, a lot of pressure on the top tier players from below, and that's why many of them are acquiring and, and doing other things. We still see platform as a service more predominant than software as a service. There's still really significant competition around usability, and this is quite interesting when we advise some of our subscribers on their selection process, you know, the choices that they make, and they notice that the interfaces can be really dramatically different. Um, beginning to externalize segmentation and personalization, this is a good thing, and that means not having those capabilities just bound within your in your uh, web channel. Uh, renewed interest in structured content, which is really interesting, um, certainly for multi-channel distribution. And um, one thing about this highly fragmented market, and, and we believe that Forrester, Gartner, and others continue to miss the, the incredible breadth of this marketplace. So that's what's going on on the... Dam uh, subway line. Dam is a relatively similar story. Again, it's it's now we really classify this as a mature marketplace um, with significant vendor differentiation on on complexity, from highly complex and of course the legacy complex into mid range and and quite a few simple solutions as well. One of the interesting things about digital asset management is that you can get fairly powerful capabilities now for a relatively strong price point, and so there's upward pressure as well. On the, on the complex vendors who have a much higher price point. Um, and that's causing a lot of change at that level, acquisitions, leadership shuffles, roadmap shifting. Mid-range still an important role um, by providing high value dam services, but maybe not the sort of object-oriented systems that you might need for more complex use cases. Um, and, uh, but there's a lot of competition there as well. And then in the simpler space, you can get some very inexpensive dam solutions for fairly simple image management, which is great. Um, but you're probably giving out, giving up, trading off in terms of the limited, you know, scenario breadth that it's going to cover. Now, if you look at a much younger marketplace like the customer data platform or CDP marketplace, it's a very different sort of structure that we found. Is that in a youthful marketplace like this, you typically find a bifurcation between, on the one hand, the major sort of suite vendors who purport to offer it, 
along and then separately a sort of big, more or less disaggregated group of pure play vendors. So this is very typical sort of profile of a younger market like CDP. The sweet vendors are largely struggling in this space, uh, mostly because they've come to it rather late. Um, and uh, you know, Adobe now has a pro forma solution. Uh, Microsoft just came out with one. What's interesting about the Microsoft one is it's actually a pretty low-end CDP. And so if we were doing this on a complexity spectrum, it would be way over on the on the right among the simpler, uh, cheaper solutions. Adobe, you can be sure, would be on the left being among the more complex ones. But the thing about the sweet vendors is that their CDPs tend to be very tied to their own marketing channels. And so they're not as um, independent and not as uh, uh, vendor neutral as you would find in some of the pure play solutions, which still give you functionally the the typically the the, the stronger, more mature, better integrated capabilities at least today. Big thing about the CDP market is that the scope of this market appears to be expanding, and I think that there's some customer risk there again that you want to be careful about what the CDP actually does does well as opposed to what it can theoretically do. So now let's talk about the other foundational service, Journey Orchestration Engines. We just added this line uh, in last year's map. Um, again, uh, some major vendors in this space and then a lot of really interesting pure play vendors as well. Um, the notion here is that this should be able to do omni-channel orchestration. The reality is most vendors come at this from a legacy of, of supporting orchestration within just one or two different channels. And so they're really kind of more multi-channel orchestration today. There's some exceptions to that, but um, the market is, I don't think, quite where we might want it to be as customers. Um, but it is growing quickly. A lot, we see a lot more interest among our subscribers in this, particularly when they start getting their data house in order. Then organizations start thinking, okay, how am I going to orchestrate and activate this data across channels? And I want some sort of engine to help me orchestrate that. And that brings them to journey orchestration engines, particularly as we start starting to think about transitioning from, okay, we've created these awesome customer journey maps, maybe as is and to be. And now how do we then act on this? How do we then make those maps executable in a way? So you need some sort of execution engine and decisioning engine, and that's what journey orchestration tools do for you. So really interesting marketplace, growing marketplace, a lot of enthusiasm around this. Also, um, a fair bit of immaturity for the actual solutions themselves, if you look at our research. Again, a wide variety of tools. This is talking about sort of where did the vendors come from. So you have these MarTech suites, which are very still very or, uh, oriented towards outbound orchestration uh, and messaging-based orchestration. You have some on the right that came out of the sort of marketing BPM or MRM space, uh, journey analytics, so more focused on journey listening maybe than journey activation. And then a couple of large vendors who have strong history in the contact center space also trying to kind of expand their wings out into other channels through journey orchestration. And then finally, pure play vendors, um, really important part of this marketplace. We'll probably be adding more this year. Um, those are the ones that are most on the channel, but the trade-off there is you're dealing with sort of younger, smaller companies. Thunderhead is actually OEM'd by Salesforce, so that when you are getting uh, Interaction Studio, which is the Salesforce journey orchestration engine, it's actually an OEM of Thunderhead. Likewise, Kite Wheel is the is the actual product behind a number of other journey orchestration services that you might see elsewhere. One example is that that's the Acquia journey orchestration engine is actually Kite Wheel underneath the covers. Again, this is the Oracle. You know, if you were going to be doing journey orchestration in either Oracle Responses or their marketing automation platform, uh, uh, Eloqua, they'll say that you can do multi-channel journey orchestration, but the reality is that the journeys are really built around messaging and not necessarily inbound or contact center or um, you know customer support journeys. The next line on our subway map is omni-channel operations hubs. And this is a new line that we added this year, really interesting marketplace. We It's a kind of an agglomeration of other kind of micro marketplaces that are beginning to overlap with each other. 
So historically, we had things like marketing resource management, campaign management, content marketing, creative operations management. And some of the vendors in those spaces, I think, felt uh, somewhat limited and have sort of elbowed out into other spaces. Uh, and so some of them might purport to do even all four of those things for you. The reality is, though, as you can imagine, most vendors are only good at one or two of them. Um, the interesting part about this is that you have some general interest collaboration platforms like Asana, um, Trello, and others that are targeting this particular use case, are targeting marketing and omni-channel CX use cases and um, really seeing that as an important uh, segment of their uh, marketplace as well. And the other thing that's very interesting here is you see a lot of uh, very old solutions that have been around for a long time and then some that are very, very spanking new and, and, and a lot in between. So it's quite a diverse marketplace and we'll have more to say about that in January. Friendly reminder as we look at the last subway line here that if you have any questions or comments or um, any kind of feedback, uh, feel free to use the questions tab in your GoToWebinar control panel and we'll have time at the end to address that. So the last marketplace segment is the newest marketplace segment that we cover on channel content platforms. Um, we kind of were the first out of the gate to define this marketplace segment independently. Um, it's a really interesting emerging trend that we're seeing that's very much uh, driven by enterprise needs. So this is one of those rare cases, I think, where the enterprises are actually need is out front of the technology. Very often we see the technology sort of out, front, out in front of enterprise needs. In this case, really, it's enterprise need kind of driving this that organizations that are really serious about customer-centered journeys want to be able to have, tell consistent stories across these different channels. They need a single place to be able to do that. Turns out that the typical web content management system, email marketing, or digital asset management system isn't particularly good at that because they tend to be bound to particular channels. And also, this platform has to be able to support a wide variety of different asset types, including text and copy, offers, of course, images, video, and audio, um, but also micro narratives, micro experiences, data, including where used data is really important for these for tracking. And so they're somewhat sophisticated systems and there's not the level of maturity that we'd like to see in this marketplace, but we think the customer demand for this is likely to be so intense that this marketplace is likely to grow up fairly quickly. So some takeaways on this particular marketplace, what we call OCP or omni-channel content platform is that um, all of us are going to need this in the future, um, but the market may be a little young right now. So you've got to test this very, very carefully. And that means that you want to meter your investment according to your urgency. We're definitely seeing some important use cases around email personalization, other dynamic marketing materials and so forth. Don't default to your incumbent web content management or DAM platform as a long-term OCP solution because it may not actually be able to grow into it. There's a whole series of things that you need to look at um, that we go into in our research, including an object orientation, data and text as first class elements. You know, there's a, there's a whole long checklist of things that really are going to make an OCP effective. And you shouldn't assume that, you, that the incumbent tool in your stack is actually going to be able to do this for you. As I mentioned, it's kind of a young marketplace. Um, it has some more complex platforms and some specialized products, um, a fairly wide variety of approaches here, some coming out of the WCM space, some coming out of the DAM space, um, and, and, um, and uh, the content marketing space. I expect that this logo chart will be bigger next year um, and maybe a little bit more differentiation and separation, but this is sort of the market that you're looking at now, and this is these are the vendors that we evaluate in this stream. Again, against about nine or 10 business use cases, which are the key criteria that we evaluate vendors against. So hopefully I've helped interpret this world for you a little bit better. Our mission in life is to support this person. We call her Stacy, the stack owner. She gets a lot of questions about a lot of different technologies, a lot of requests for new technologies. She wants to build and maintain a coherent stack. And at Real Story Group, our mission in life is to sort of shield Stacy and, and help her make really good decisions so she can think about more interesting things like what shall she have for, for lunch that afternoon. And so we've been privileged to be both a guide and an advocate and supporter uh, for Stacy, the stack owner across 
dozens of enterprises around the world. And um, if that uh, is something that you find useful, definitely interested to engage. There's three different ways that we can work together. One is a vendor selection advisory. So if you're going to be selecting a CDP or web content management platform, digital asset management, CRM, all the different lines on the subway map, you can subscribe to our research. And between our research and advisory services, we'll inform and empower your tech team with really critical research and candid advice to make a good decision. Some large enterprises just do an all-you-can-eat thing where they subscribe to all of our research. And in that case, what we're doing is we're kind of advising you on your stack as a whole and uh, helping you make strategic decisions and technology choices. And then among those, we have invited an exclusive group of stack owners to join this executive leadership council. Um, met first in September, meeting again in February. Uh, it's a private peer support group, and it's a lot of really interesting things coming out of that. So here's how you can engage with us further, and I'll invite you again if you have questions or comments to use the uh, go to webinar control panel. And uh, Scott, if you want to just quickly talk about next steps while I review the questions. Definitely. Thanks, Tony. And uh, for those that were interested in today's topic, you can uh, get our predictions uh, for the technology marketplaces we cover for 2020. Uh, we're going to have a webinar on that next Wednesday at this same time. So uh, please stay tuned for that and join us if you can. Uh, also wanted to mention that we're happy to show you a behind the scenes tour of the subscriber experience. So uh, if what Tony mentioned to you is of interest in regards to either the, the vendor selection advisory or perhaps even looking at the full uh, stack advisory offering that we have available, reach out to us at explorerealstorygroup.com and we can schedule that uh, demonstration of our different uh, decision tools for creating custom shortlists and also comparing the vendors side by side. You're welcome to download excerpts from any or all of our research areas at any time. Um, it does look like there are a, a number of questions in the queue. So Tony, I'll kick it back to you to address as many of those as you can. Yeah, so the first one is from Folka and he's asking, why has Stebo, the software, longstanding software vendor Stebo, never made it onto our subway maps? They've been around for ages and kind of omnipresent. Yeah, Stebo is one of those vendors, you know, they've evolved over time. We first looked at them, I think, in the early 2000s around web content management and other sorts of things that has kind of been a lot of different things and not neatly falling into these categories. Um, so, you know, we tend to look at marketplaces to help people make decisions. And it's true, folk, that sometimes our vendors that just don't fit neatly into a category or that move among them and can be difficult for us to uh, classify and compare against in a structured way. This is the sort of situation, and Sebo's not alone in this regard, where oftentimes when one of our subscribers has a question about it, we talk it through with them on the phone rather than covering it in a more formal way. Aaron is asking a really great question about um, uh, uh, do we have a subway map that shows out-of-the-box integrations between the different vendors across the channels, for example, Media Valet plus Reich, Media Valet. You know, being a damn vendor, right? Being an omni-channel operations hub, and that's a really significant many-to-many -many problem. And it's interesting to think about how you would visualize that. We don't have a visual on that. We do cover integrations during in the individual vendor evaluations. You have to be really careful, Aaron, about when a vendor says they have an out-of-the-box connector, <laughs> um, because our experience is that those can be an attempt at a connector or a one-off thing or something that was done professional services and then productized. So we tend to be somewhat skeptical about claims of integration. At what revenue, or uh, Scott's asking an interesting question here, at what revenue communication channel stream does it make sense for a company to invest in a kite wheel? When does it make sense to move from organized channel management to orchestration? That's a great that's a great question. Um, you know, at what at what point do you does it make sense to do omni-channel orchestration as opposed to just amping up the decision rules within each individual channel itself? And um, there's no simple metric around this. I think that it is the natural outgrowth of not so much your size, but um, but your decision to say we're going to to build a customer-centric stack as opposed to an us-centric stack, a channel-centric stack, right? And if you make a customer-centric stack instead of a channel-centric stack, then you do need some sort of 
cross-channel orchestration, you do need cross-channel data store, and you're going to need a different set of skills. So it is a significant investment, not just in the technology, but also um, potentially reshaping your internal staff and organization. So it's less about size um, and more around um, your, your customer-centric orientation and a decision to actually put you know, resources around shaping this at a more enterprise level. Uh, Frederick is saying thank you, okay, um, and uh, it, always good to see you, Mr. Sonoy. Uh, and so that then brings us to the bottom of the half hour, and I want to thank you all for joining us and for uh, uh, wishing you a, a very uh, happy rest of your month. Just a friendly reminder that we do have this awesome webinar coming up on predictions that uh, for 2020, which uh, my colleague Jared will undertake, and you can sign up for that on our website under the webinars tab. So for Scott Dill, this is Tony Byrne and the rest of the Real Story Group team signing off. Thanks again. Bye now.